I'm Nancy Kopp. I am the neighboring state treasurer. Uh, my office is in Annapolis, Maryland, the first capital of the United States, before Congress went to Philadelphia. So we've been having a long time to learn. Uh, I want to uh, thank you all for inviting me to join because this is a very, very exciting panel. And the fact that we have gone beyond simply uh, talking about school classes in financial literacy to understanding that empowering the entire community and the individuals in the community is a very important integral part of the, uh, of the program is a step forward. We have a panel, a first panel today of community leaders, a second panel of, uh, of business representatives, and then a third presentation on education. And as Gene Sperling said, it is, all, it is all one. It is all tied together. It's all of the above. And uh, I hope that as we go through uh, today, we'll be able to see those strains that run through everything and tie everything together. I will say only one thing about myself personally, because we're starting a little late, and I want to hear from the folks here. But my first experience in financial literacy was when I was at the laboratory school at the University of Chicago about 60 years ago. And I remember thinking as I worked at our bank in the fourth grade, because there always was a bank in the elementary school, and we were learning about bank accounts. People wrote checks in those days. I remember standing there and thinking how wonderful it was that the kids from the second grade could start learning along with us, the older kids. So this is not a new issue, but never has it been, I think, as critical as it is now, at least in the last 70 or 80 years uh, in America. I, uh, I think you all know the members of the panel, but let me just introduce them very briefly, and maybe we'll go one by one, and then maybe we could have a, a minute to, uh, to talk amongst ourselves. Uh, Tanya Fiddler is a leader in the Native Community Development Financial Institution and the executive, executive director of, uh, of the four bands. She has actually taken concrete steps and uh, initiated a number of programs, including Making Waves, uh, which I've just spent some time reading about on the internet, and it's absolutely uh, fascinating, to replace poverty and unemployment with financial literacy and entrepreneurship. And I was very pleased that, that Gene Sperling and John Rogers all pointed out, we need both things. We need literate individuals and communities with clear and easily accessible information. We also need a decent economy, fair wages, and enforcement of the laws. So this all works together, and I think in either the state level economy, the city, or, or the, uh, uh, the local economy, uh, th it all has to be tied together. So Tanya, tell us a little bit about your program and then, if you could, just touch on what lessons learned could maybe be applied in a far broader community. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we're a, a Native Community Development Financial Institution on the Cheyenne River Reservation and we started this work oh, some time over a decade ago. Uh, working to create a private sector, build assets on the Cheyenne River Reservation, um, Dewey and Zeebok counties are some of the highest poverty counties, and that isn't the, the end of the story, though we also have a lot of wonderful attributes and, and especially traditional culture and economies that we needed to revive because Lakota people were strong in resource management, planning, self-sufficiency, and, and all of that, and we wanted to bring that back. It was very, very important. We saw that opportunity with, with the assets that we had. So we needed to somehow um, revive people's understanding of that. We had been working on financial literacy and entrepreneurship with adults since inception of our community fund and realized that with 45% of our population under the age of 18, about two or three years into our work, that we needed to target youth you know, and, and community partners and our tribal governments. So we created this Making Waves campaign. Um, we have a toolkit for teachers that integrates both concepts of financial literacy and entrepreneurship into the K through 12 school system, understanding that school systems are very stressed and teachers didn't need to be teaching another class. We, we looked at the core subject areas in addition to ag classes, art classes, 
kind of what Mr. Cordray's book, you know, the, how do you put those principles back in? So it took a comprehensive approach to doing that. Meanwhile, enlisted um, the, the school system, but the community partners, employers, and currently our tribal government um, requiring for its all tribal employees to be um, taking personal finance classes. You know, so it's, it's from all the way around the horn. I do think you need to be doing everything. And uh, do you have ways of measuring the progress or the benefit? Do you know when you're doing well? We, we do. Um, I, I would give an example of 500 people completing personal finance training, um, going further to take out credit building loans that we offer as a CDFI, uh, improving their credit scores within the first six months um, by uh, half of them improving credit scores within the first six months, up to a year, 18 months out, the majority of them improving credit scores. And one of the phenomena for our area was that 55% of the people on Cheyenne River um, had no credit files, which is a little higher than the national average. And those that had credit files were scoring 100 points lower than the national average. So we knew we had to be very, very aggressive um, as well. And that, that's one of the better examples or right off the top of my head. I think that's a great example and one that I know across the country, one major reason that people are not getting jobs is not only that there are not enough jobs available, but bad credit ratings have, have wrecked job applications and yet I think un until people really see it face to face, we have not done a very good job of explaining why it's important. Credit identity is just another asset that we need to be building for ourselves. Let me ask Mary DuPont from, uh, from Delaware. You too have uh, created a number of programs with both the public and the private sector aimed again at people throughout their lives and throughout the community. Can you tell us a little about your model? Um, I'm working with the state of Delaware, and um, when our governor was elected in 2008, Jack former state treasurer Jack Markell, <laughs> your old buddy, uh, state treasurers definitely uh, have a big role and a big stake in this work, um, as Jose will tell us. He's not a state treasurer, but a uh, city treasurer, and. Um, he led the charge in the state of Delaware around this issue of financial literacy and financial capability. And when he was elected governor, um, at the time I was in the nonprofit sector, and there's so many amazing people here in this room who have inspired the work that we're doing now in Delaware. And among them is Kathy Mann with the New York City Office of Financial Empowerment. Because what we started to see is that there is a role for government to play in bringing people to the table and in promoting awareness and in integrating the whole issue of financial empowerment into all of what we do. And it seems like everyone's been saying the same thing in all the comments here but through uh, in education, uh, in the workplace, uh, in government. Um, in government, we're working with so many people and we're affecting so many lives every day. And um, so Mike Bloomberg, I think, was a kind of a champion in this work. And he definitely inspired um, Jack Markell, who was already there. Um, and now we're working at the state level uh, we started a partnership with the United Way of Delaware, and my partner, Michelle Taylor, is here today. And um, we formed a joint venture, a public-private partnership, uh, and a program called Stand By Me, which offers one-on-one -on -one financial coaching, uh, access to consumer-friendly financial services and products, um, some of which we design and others which are offered by credit unions and banks. And we also work with students and families around um, accessing post-secondary education, financial, all the financial aspects of that, financial planning, FAFSA, 
uh, managing student loan debt. So that's what we do, and so we take this package and um, what the methodology is is that we co-locate. So we're working with uh, supermarkets, we're working with Walgreens, we work with um, hotels and, um, and uh, we're talking to hospitals and uh, in, ter in terms of the employers. And I guess I'm most proud because my own department, the Department of Health and Social Services, which is the largest agency in state government, um, is hiring two coaches for our own workforce. And we also work a, with a the- A role model. A role model, yes. I mean, our secretary said, wait a minute, we're working with the supermarkets and the drugstores. We have so many employees who, who could benefit from this, who need this help. So um, I'm really happy to see that we're doing walk in the walk. And then we're working with community colleges and we just formed a partnership with a school district um, that has five high schools and four middle schools. So we're putting together a plan to connect those dots, working with students and families. It, it sounds clearly that one of the lessons is linkage and not reinventing wheels because we don't have time uh, Right. To do that. I think one of the big things that I'm recognizing after doing this work my whole life uh, from the nonprofit side is that the empty seat at the table was government and I sort of knew that intuitively but now that we're here doing this work it's amazing how everybody that I just referred to is saying yes we need this. So there's no arm twisting or you know sales pitch yeah. or anything. Everybody wants, I mean, we're at a time now, the moment has come, I think. It seems to me clearly um, all over the country, people are talking about financial literacy and making significant, uh, creating significant programs. But, but one of the things you're absolutely right is how to bring everybody to the table at the same time and build on each other through synergy as opposed to just uh, repeating. Jose, you've done a lot in this, not only in San Francisco, but with the cities across, across the nation in many different areas. Why don't you tell us what, what you've learned? Sure, uh, thank you so much for having me here. And as a city treasurer, I do want to note, I, I think I see a little bit of a theme going on out there. In fact, I'm not sure if everybody knows that Director Cordray is a former county treasurer, I believe, and state treasurer. State so, you know, I don't know. It's sounding like a, a pattern here. Um, I'm excited to be here today to talk about what we're doing in San Francisco, but also about what a number of cities across the country are, are working on when it comes to what we call financial empowerment. Um, we have a dozen cities already in our coalition of cities doing this work. And I really want to build on, I think, what everybody has said. Um, local government is, I think, where we're seeing some of the most innovative programs um, um, being created and being implemented. And I think there's good reason for that. Um, local government is, is, as are our community groups and many of our um, private companies, right there on, at ground level. We are right there with our communities. We, we interact every day with the people in our cities. We see the folks who are being taken advantage of, frankly, and we see how folks could be benefited in their everyday life if we could find a way to give them better tools, uh, better information, and better access to the products they want to use. Let me describe a couple of things that some of the cities have done. Um, probably one of the, um, the most uh, widely implemented programs is a program that we launched first in San Francisco to help get connect people connected to bank accounts. Um, it was simply to reach out to folks who were unbanked, who had nowhere to go with their paychecks and anything else that they received, but these check cashers, where we know they would get overcharged, if not even ripped off, and offered even more predatory uh, opportunities. Um, we launched a program we called Bank on San Francisco now over six years ago. We partnered, though, with everybody already in our communities. We partnered with our banks and credit unions in the city. We partnered with employers and, and nonprofit groups and community groups to help us get the word out. We partnered with literally everybody we could find. And to your point a minute ago, I think one of the most effective things that city government can do is it can convene all those players. Believe me, when the mayor of a city 
or better yet, a city treasurer, calls all the financial institutions in town and says, I'd like you to come down and, and meet with us and consider working on this problem with us, financial institutions tend to show up. And then, frankly, they did more than show up. They, they um, participated. They even changed some of their product offerings. Uh, they did a lot of outreach. They educated their own staff. And what we saw in San Francisco was that each year those banks and credit unions we worked with reported opening over 10,000 accounts each year for folks who had previously been unbanked. That's an exciting result for San Francisco. But today, over 100 cities across the country are now, have either launched their own bank on program or are in the process of doing that. It wasn't an expensive program to launch. It wasn't um, a, 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 a incredibly difficult program to launch if we got the partnerships right. And it's clearly made a lot of impact in our community. Across our dozen cities in our coalition, we're seeing a variety of different programs, again, reaching out at all age levels, many of them to youth, across all, uh, all sorts of goals, um, both financial access, like getting people connected to bank accounts, um, as well as um, financial asset building, savings, saving for the future, learning the power of savings, realizing goals and making the most of our money. I think that's what's important, and cities are in a unique place uh, to be able to do that. I think one of the, uh, one of the clear lessons is, uh, is the need to, to have a site, have, have a convener, have a site, and then have people share information. Let me just say for Maryland that uh, we had a driver, uh, uh, a person who was absolutely dedicated to this, a former, uh, uh, regulator, banking regulator in Maryland who decided about 10 years ago or 15 now that she was going to pull everybody together and it really took that and she reached out to the private sector, she actually went back to banking, but reached out to the private sector, to banking, to, to, uh, to law firms, to financial investors of course, and to the schools and to the, uh, to the public agencies, to the social service agencies, actually to everybody she could think of. And then started convening meetings, quarterly meetings that went on for a number of years, still go on, but went on for a number of years and the coalition built up. It however did take a significant uh, uh, push to break through and then bring the schools in with, uh, 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 with the private sector. This was, this was something rather new, and I know the schools feel that, uh, that so much is being demanded of them that uh, this is just one more, one more add-on. But it sounds to me like you all, in fact, have done that, have brought in both the social service providers, the nonprofits, the schools, and the private sector. Do you have any, any uh, pointers to people throughout the country who are trying to, to do that, to bridge that gap? I would, I would say once you provide teachers in the system with a viable tool, we invested in training in the upfront. This was part of sustainability and long-term thinking for us. So engaging with the, the school system in the beginning, giving them a good tool and supporting them in the implementation. Today, we don't go back to the schools. There's five schools on our reservation. We don't go back in every year and say, now you have to teach this. Now, you know, they run our Making Waves curriculum. They use it for their summer school activities. So it's, it's about um, getting buy-in, you know, on a community level, on a personal individual change level. And when you start to see the positive effect of, of kids being encouraged or some of our kids starting businesses or, you know, those types of things, the increase in savings accounts in our communities and um, that type of thing, we, we don't go back out and tell them. But now throughout our reservation and spreading to other reservations that are um, par our partners within our networks, more folks are doing it. So I think providing the hand-holding up front, you know, we talked about, you know, it doesn't, it's not uh, labor intensive, cost intensive, maybe in the beginning, but once you get it and get the buy-in and, and everybody agrees and, and places those values and holds those values up, especially in our communities, it, it takes off and we don't go back to it again. You know, people are sold once they've, part of it is getting the teachers financial literate, you know, in, it, in the system. And see, one thing I wanted to mention is in San Francisco, we have a strong uh, partnership with a new program we've launched in, uh, in partnership with the school district. Um, this is one to promote college savings um, for every child in our city. There's a recent study that shows that if a child grows up with a college savings account in the child's name, 
You've heard of this. That child is many times more likely to go to college compared to a child without a similar account. We know, we know full well that many of our low-income families were not for a long time, maybe never, going to get around to opening up a college savings account for their child. And we know full well that in our public school system, the majority of our, our students are, are low income, are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. Um, we wanted to bring that kind of success to our, 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 all of our students in San Francisco. So we partnered with the public school district in San Francisco when we launched a program we call Kindergarten to College. It is the first of its kind. We, the city, open automatically for every child entering that public school at kindergarten, we open up a college savings account. Again, I want to say automatically, no signature required by parents, no paperwork, nothing. The child enters kindergarten and literally a few weeks later, an envelope arrives at the house, um, welcome to your kindergarten to college account, here's your account card, here's your account ID number, here's how you make deposits, and by the way, the city has put the first deposit uh, $50 into the account. The account is now real and it's important and it's there for every single child who enters the public schools. But, but we all know that $50 is never going to add up to enough money to go to college, right? I mean, obviously. So we, we know that the success of these accounts really relies on the families getting engaged and finding a way to save. So we raised, in addition to what the city was putting into the investing in these accounts in terms of the initial deposit, we, re we raised private money. With those private funds, we offer two important cash incentives to the families. The first says, we'll match dollar for dollar everything you save in this account up to the first $100 to get you motivated to start saving in this account. And then secondly, we say, if you'll make an automatic transfer into the account, say direct deposit from your paycheck or an automatic transfer from another account and keep it in place for at least six months, another $100 cash incentive goes into the account. In less than 12 months, we've seen a significant portion of our families already start to save. But what I think is even more exciting is that when we look at those early savers, those first families to save, the majority of them are free and reduced price lunch eligible families. They are the lowest income families in our city, making up the majority of the population of families engaging with this account. Not only do we think that's important to build financial assets for the kids, but we partnered with the school district to say, now that you know every kid in the classroom has this account, can we work with you to build some financial education curriculum into the everyday uh, conversation in those classrooms? And they have been excited and, and, and uh, committed to doing exactly that. So we've developed grade level appropriate financial education, including kindergarten level, um, that they're actually implementing in the classroom. So we're very excited to see where we can go with this program. That, 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 is, that is a great program. And um, I chair the college savings program in Maryland, so I know the statistics you're talking about. And there is no doubt that one, when a, a kid and a family know that they are saving for college, they know that they are expected to perform and to go to college, graduate from college. And that consciousness of expectation propels them, and you, and you can see it throughout their, uh, their school career. It also inspires the teachers, by the way, and the entire educational community, because they know something is expected of them, too. So I think, I think the lessons that I have heard thus far is that you have to go one-on-one -on -one and community-wide, that you have to get people where they are and understand what particular issue or challenge is facing them. When we say, as an older person, I, I hope you're reaching out to those who are not prepared to retire at all, but may not be able to continue working. It's a whole new group of, program, of, of problems that we have not yet consciously addressed, I think. Um, and and this, this strain of being in the community, that is having all the members of the community uh, pulling together what, whatever the community is. Now, one of the interesting things about talking about this now as opposed to 20 years ago, I think you all have Facebook pages and websites, is that right? So people can find out more information about your programs, but also, the, I'm, I'm interested still, Jose, in this, uh, uh, it's not a League of Cities, but uh, uh, a coalition. 
because one of my questions is, I know my city, Baltimore, does not seem to be a member. Right. How do we get people to join together? Well, we're excited to see more cities join our coalition. Um, and, and what we're doing is we're creating exciting models to do exactly what you're talking about, to provide financial education, but even more importantly, I believe, financial access and, and real opportunities to, for allowing people to get ahead. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's great, it's, it's so on point that you brought up um, the internet and, and online presence. Um, actually, our colleagues in New York uh, championed an effort around uh, financial education um, opportunities where they and now a number of other cities, ours, ours included, have launched websites where we actually put together all the resources around financial education in our cities and make them available to our folks through uh, one unified uh, resource, namely these, these websites. We also do some interesting um, events throughout the year to kind of publicize this, this new resource. Um, again, following New York's great lead, um, we did a phone-a-thon uh, last year to have people call in and ask financial advice, get, get financial advice for free. A number of our cities, um, uh, if not almost all of them, have worked with our uh, local chapters of certified financial planners. And, and we in San Francisco and many of the others have hosted what we call uh, financial planning days, where during one day, a Saturday during the year, anybody can come down, sit down for free with a certified financial planner, not a cheap thing to do most of the time, and have a half hour to talk about whatever they want to talk about financially. We've had between three and 400 people show up on any given Saturday that we hold that event. And that is something that we do intermittently throughout the year to let people know that we have these resources available in our community so they can go out, reach out to them, and make sure they're getting access. Uh, our coalition is called Cities for Financial Empowerment. I encourage people to reach out and get in touch with us. If there's this kind of work going on in your city, we'd like to know about it, and we'd like to talk to you about joining our coalition because we see a lot of value in getting our cities together, being able to trade best practices, support each other, and learn collectively how we can do more and more and more in our communities. And I will say that the National Association of State Treasurers, just to put in a plug, working with uh, a broad, broad coalition also is setting up these pages and actually is working with our, our, uh, our fellow state treasurers in Mexico because many of us have, have Spanish sites, uh, Spanish language sites, and they are actually just taking the, Spanish, the, the relevant information uh, from the Spanish uh, uh, language sites and putting it on, uh, on their own sites. It's the question of the coalitions growing and growing. And I think this event and, and John Rogers and your work and, and your colleagues to be a point, uh, a point for uh, gathering information and bringing people together and, and being able to help people who want to link hands but don't know how to reach across and, uh, and, and, and join together. It's a wonderful opportunity. We have about four minutes, I think, for questions. If, uh, if anyone out there has a question of these folks, including maybe just repeating what their websites are. If anyone has other questions, you can come to the microphone, that would be great. And if not, if any of you have questions of each other, this is a, a great opportunity. I would just say that, um, as, I, as I said before, there is a lot of great work that's going on in the country, and um, you don't have to figure it out. I think that, you know, by going to Cities for Financial Empowerment, people are invited to visit our website, standbymede.org, um, and just, you know, talking to people. Uh, I think you can really get a lot of ideas and a lot of um, inspiration. And I think that, you know, the inclusiveness that I'm seeing now with everybody coming together, this is going to be the way that we're really going to be able to have that impact. And we're just a year old, but, you know, we've already served over a thousand people in Delaware um, through our partnerships that, that I talked about. And, and I think that, you know, we need to really weave these concepts into the fabric of what we all do every day. So um, I guess that doesn't... And, and just one step more broadly, I think it is fair to point out that an, an enlightened and empowered consumer makes for a better market. Absolutely. Uh, and maybe what we need is not just government and looking at 
at, uh, at, at whether uh, regulations are being observed or laws are being followed, but the consumers to know what they are entitled to expect and then to demand. A plug. Okay. I'm Marianne Campbell from the Family and Consumer Science Department of the University of Central Arkansas, and I'm very impressed, Jose, with what you're doing with the kindergarten to college. It's just so exciting. I have a question about, because we've done some things where we put money into accounts and so forth. How do you keep people from pulling it back out and what is your ratio? What, what's going on there? Excellent question. That was, a, a, of course, a concern for us to make sure that, that, that this money would be used for its intended purpose, right? That, that kids would be able to have, be assured the money is there to go to college. Um, the way we've structured this work, and I have to acknowledge the great partner um, we have in City, Citibank, who's uh, our account holder in this program, is we actually open up what's called a custodial account in the name of the city and county of San Francisco. And all the, in, the children's um, kindergarten to college accounts are actually technically sub-accounts to the custodial account. What, what results with that is then that once the money goes in, it cannot be withdrawn without the approval of the city being the, uh, the custodial account holder. So our, our message very clearly to all of the, the families is this is strictly a one-way account until your child goes to college. The monies go in, they stay there, okay. um, they'll, we'll provide matches, we'll provide opportunities, we're gonna provide financial education, but that money is intended to stay there until your child needs it to go to college and it is absolutely safe. Wonderful, great. Very, very good and pointed question. And with that, I want to thank you all very much. It's been a wonderful education for me. I feel, you'll feel much more literate now than I was. And Raquel, back over to you. Thank you.